Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank the, the Faculty of Health Science and Engineering at Edith Cowan University for uh, funding a visiting professorship for me to come here and do a little work with uh, Dr. Rob Newton and Dr. Daniel Galveo uh, at Edith Cowan University. And also thank um, Cancer Council WA for hosting this talk as well. So today I'm gonna share with you uh, some recent data on what I think is probably the most important question for many cancer patients and many oncologists is, what is the role of exercise after a cancer diagnosis as it relates to recurrence and survival? So we know there's many important outcomes. Much of the research done by Rob Newton, Daniel Galveo, looking at symptoms, side effects, fitness improvements, and so on. These are all very important outcomes, and I think those benefits alone are a very good reason to exercise while you're going through cancer treatments and recovery after treatments. But perhaps uh, the most critical one is this idea, what about long-term survivorship? Can it really lower my risk of having a recurrence of the disease and improve survival? And that's really the focus of my talk today. So I'll share with you a brief overview of physical activity as it relates to cancer survival, and then really just share some of the data we've generated in Canada looking at this question. So some data from one of our trials we call the START trial, which was in breast cancer patients. Another uh, uh, update of a cohort study we have going on we call the AMBER cohort, also in breast cancer patients. A uh, HELP trial, which was done in lymphoma patients. Update of the, uh, a trial we call the CHALLENGE trial, which is actually a collaboration between Canada and Australia, uh, looking at um, exercise in colon cancer. And lastly, a brief um, um, comment on the GAP4 trial, a trial that's going to be starting very shortly, where Australia is playing quite a leadership role in this particular trial. What all these trials will have in common is the focus on recurrence and survival, rather than uh, quality of life, symptoms, and side effects. So many of you might be aware that exercise has implications for the prevention of cancer. So we know it can prevent the development of some cancers like breast cancer, colon cancer, and potentially other cancers as well. So one question is, well, why don't we just simply generalize from cancer prevention to the survivorship side and assume that it'll have the same benefits afterwards? And there's a number of reasons really why we can't just generalize from cancer prevention to survivorship, that we actually need to generate our data here and look at this particular question. So the mechanisms may be different between a, uh, the cancer occurring in the first place as well as uh, the recurrence. Uh, the effects of exercise on those mechanisms might be different after treatments. After you've been through chemotherapy hormone treatments, we can't assume that exercise might have the same effects on those biological mechanisms. We also know cancer patients get many treatments that are designed to target these pathways that we think exercise might actually be beneficial for as well. So you might already be getting those benefits from various treatments you're on, and it might sort of nullify any role of exercise. Uh, and then I think one of the key uh, interesting points from my perspective is this interaction with treatments. Most cancer patients are going to receive some form of treatment, oftentimes multiple treatments, and the question is, what role does exercise play while you're receiving these treatments, interacting with these treatments, and can it help for better or for worse? And then lastly, perhaps cancer patients are really too old to benefit. When you think about lifestyle and cancer prevention, we're oftentimes looking at behaviors that start in the early 20s for a diagnosis that's going to happen when you're 70. So you've engaged in a behavior for 50 years and potentially can prevent that uh, cancer. But diagnosed with cancer where a recurrence might happen in three years or five years is a much shorter time period and at a much older stage in life with many people being diagnosed in their 60s and 70s. So there's all sorts of reasons why we actually need to do the research and look at can exercise improve recurrence and survival. These are some of the mechanisms. I won't go into them in too much detail other than to say there are some plausible biological mechanisms for how exercise might lower the risk of recurrence. It's related to things like sex hormones, uh, androgens and estrogens. Insulin uh, seems to be a, a potentially big part of the story related to insulin sensitivity and the various markers that go along with that. Immune function, very important for cancer uh, um, outcomes, and inflammation as well. 
Now, we also know that cancer patients, uh, many of them will survive their cancer and oftentimes end up dying from other uh, diseases other than a recurrence of the disease. So other uh, things that become important are things related to heart disease and diabetes, such as lipids, blood pressure, and, and so on. Uh, and all these um, potential mechanisms are, are sort of through changes in obesity, body composition, changes in aerobic fitness, muscular strength, and potentially even changes in quality of life. We know that patients with higher quality of life also live longer as well. So there's various explanations for how exercise might ultimately improve survival. In a very simple uh, framework, uh, we can see where exercise might have implications after a cancer diagnosis. Um, certainly it can influence the types of treatments that cancer patients are offered. If you're in very poor physical condition, uh, frail, you might not be offered potentially life-saving treatments because these treatments can be very difficult. Major surgeries, cardiotoxic uh, drugs that can be hard on the heart, and your oncologist is not likely to recommend these treatments if you're not in very good physical health. So exercise and staying fit can potentially help you receive these treatments, especially in cancers where there might be multiple treatments over time, what we call second-line and third-line treatment. So you're treated and you're well for a while. Two, three, four years later, the cancer recurs. You get another round of treatment. A couple years later again. So there's all these treatment uh, modalities that can potentially help patients. But if you're not physically fit and in good enough health, you might not be given those treatments. Potentially also influence uh, completion of those treatments. As I mentioned, these treatments can be fairly difficult and it takes a lot to get through these treatments. And patients who are fitter and in better condition uh, might be able to complete their treatments. And I'll show you some interesting data suggesting some support for that idea. And also then the efficacy of the treatments. How well do these drugs work in your body when you're not very fit versus when you are fit? How well do they work in your body when you're exercising regularly versus if you're not exercising regularly? Again, I'll show you some very provocative data suggesting that chemotherapy drugs might actually work better in terms of killing cancer cells if you're exercising while you're getting those treatments. And lastly, you can see just at the, the end of the uh, diagram that there's sort of two main pathways uh, that exercise can influence mortality. One is the cancer-specific one. So this is the role it might play in reducing recurrence um, or um, disease progression. And then the other is this idea of other diseases, such as heart disease, diabetes, and other factors as well. So this is a, a, a kind of general overview of a, a review that was done on this topic. I don't know how well you can see that at the back, but I can give you the key take-home message. These are all observational studies looking at uh, the role of physical activity as it relates to, in this case, um, cancer-specific mortality. Most of the research has been done in breast and colon cancer. And what these uh, data show is that overall, across all these studies, and there's probably about 15 to 20 studies now that have been done on this topic, uh, cancer patients who report higher rates of exercise um, seem to experience lower risk of cancer-specific mortality, so dying from their cancer. And it's about a 30 to 40 percent lower risk compared to patients who are inactive um, after a cancer diagnosis. And this is the data for all-cause mortality. So this includes dying from things other than cancer, such as uh, heart disease, diabetes, other um, um, complications. Again, similar pattern. The patients who are more active after their cancer diagnosis have a lower chance of dying from um, all these different causes. And it's about, again, a 40, uh, 30 to 40% lower risk of developing cancer. So this is pretty good data. It's fairly consistent data suggesting higher rates of exercise, lower rates of um, dying from cancer, as well as heart disease. But there's a number of problems with um, these data. And probably the biggest problem with these data is there's no randomized controlled trials that have looked at an exercise intervention with survival endpoints. For research scientists, randomized controlled trial is the best quality evidence that shows us it's a causal effect of exercise on these cancer outcomes. Because there's all sorts of explanations for why people who exercise more might also survive their cancer. 
uh, and the nature of the design of observational studies doesn't really allow us to tease out whether it's truly the exercise that is causing this improvement in survival. So it's very uh, important that we look at these randomized trials. There's other limitations as well uh, related to this research. Uh, they really haven't focused on physical activity and fitness as the primary um, indicator. And because of that, they don't have good quality evidence such as objective measures of exercise. They oftentimes rely on patient self-reports of exercise, which are reasonably valid, but do have some um, problems with uh, error. We don't have objective measures of fitness assessment, linking things like uh, aerobic exercise, uh, maximal fitness, muscular strength, and these types of measures, uh, which are, again, the gold standard indicators of health-related fitness, and whether or not these might be linked to survival. Other problems you can see here related to the design of the studies, adjusting for other important uh, data that can really influence these associations. And uh, outside of breast and colon cancer, a little bit in prostate cancer linking to survival, but not a whole lot. So we know a little bit about some cancers, but there's a lot of other cancers we don't really know too much about. So this is a, a trial that we designed many years ago, um, to tr and it really, uh, I'll present some data here to try and look at that, this issue of the, the link between exercise and, and survival. The trial was originally uh, comparing aerobic exercise to resistance exercise or strength training compared to a usual care group that did no exercise in 242 breast cancer patients who were receiving chemotherapy at the time. So they were all on chemotherapy at the time. And our goal originally was to look at whether or not uh, exercise helped these patients get through their treatments in terms of things like reducing symptoms, improving quality of life, maintaining their fitness and function. And that was really the focus of the study. And we did show some benefits related to these outcomes. So you can see here that uh, the aerobic exercise intervention prevented declines in fitness that we now know happen uh, during these types of treatments. So there's very good evidence now that if you go through these cancer treatments, you will experience declines in aerobic fitness and muscular strength that go beyond what would normally be expected. In other words, it's not that you just have an exercise for that point of time. There's actual damage to the cardiovascular and, and, and muscular systems that really um, re result in these types of declines. And you can see here that without an intervention, the usual care group there, their fitness declines fairly significantly over the course of this chemotherapy. The aerobic exercise intervention was able to prevent that decline. Same with muscular strength. So here we have uh, the usual care group with no change and about a 20 to 30 percent improvement in muscular strength in the group that did weight training while they were going through chemotherapy. And this would be an expected finding uh, based on the type of intervention that we did. Change in lean body mass. This is turning out to be a, a potentially very important outcome from cancer patients. We know many patients on different types of treatments will lose lean body mass and gain fat while they go through these types of treatments. And there's some very interesting data suggesting that patients who are sarcopenic, in other words, have very low amounts of lean body mass, don't process the drugs very well, have very toxic side effects to these drugs, and it can actually undermine their ability to complete their treatments. So losing lean body mass while you're going through these treatments can have um, bad outcomes, not just for things like physical functioning and quality of life, but actually for the effectiveness of the treatments uh, that you're going through as well. And so here, over the course of, I think it was about a 16, 17-week um, course of chemotherapy, these patients put on about a kilogram of muscle over that short time going through these difficult treatments. Change in body fat as well, again for these breast cancer patients, uh, and these are measured by DEXA scan, so these are objective measures of how much fat and how much muscle you have in the body. You can see here that without any intervention, breast cancer patients gain fat while they go through these treatments. And some data suggesting that Obesity levels, higher uh, rates of uh, fat mass are associated with an earlier recurrence of the disease and shorter survival. So these treatments that are designed to cure you of your cancer and potentially save your life can also paradoxically have some of these negative effects that might actually be undermining their treatment. 
And with interventions like uh, exercise, we can offset some of the side effects that these treatments are causing while still getting the benefits that those treatments are designed to provide you. But this was, uh, I think, the finding that got most of the attention from this particular trial. This was the first study to really try and document how much chemotherapy were these patients getting while they went through treatment. And our real, real goal was uh, hopefully to show that exercise was not interfering with patients' ability to complete their chemotherapy. The last thing you want to do when you're trying to help a patient with quality of life and physical functioning and these types of outcomes is to be undermining their ability to complete treatments and benefit from those treatments. So we wanted to show that exercise was not having a negative effect on their ability to complete chemotherapy. And we actually showed not only did exercise not have a negative benefit, the patients who did the weight training uh, during their breast cancer chemotherapy completed more of their chemotherapy than the patients who did no exercise. And even the group that did the aerobic exercise completed more of their chemotherapy. Not significantly so, not a reliable finding, but the trend was in that direction. And this was really the first study to show that exercising while you're getting chemotherapy can actually help with your ability to complete all of those treatments, probably by helping with things like bone marrow recovery between treatments and also reducing these very toxic side effects that can result in dose reductions or delays in your treatments, which are not very good. So again, a very uh, exciting finding. And we had done this trial back in 2003 to 2005. That's when these patients were randomized uh, in this particular study. And so we thought, boy, maybe we should just follow up for these long-term outcomes. This is what the oncologists kept asking for. What are the long-term outcomes of these studies? What, what are the links to recurrence and survival? So in 2012, the summer of 2012, we went back and did an electronic record search of everyone who participated in this study, and we could abstract all the events they had. Did they have a recurrence of their disease? Was it a local recurrence, a distant recurrence? Did they die from their breast cancer, or did they die from some other cause? And then we explored what are the same outcomes that you would see in any chemotherapy trial or any radiation therapy trial. We looked at what's called disease-free survival, and that means how long do you go before you have a bad event, in this case a recurrence of the breast cancer or a death from any cause. Um, or overall survival, which is looking at death from any cause. We did the standard analysis and, and uh, followed up many months later. We did combine both exercise groups, so both the weight training group and the aerobic exercise group were combined because it wasn't a large uh, study compared to some of the uh, drug trials. And I think the key thing here is looking at the overall events. You can see uh, about 43 patients out of the 242 had what we call a disease-free survival event, and I mentioned what those are. But it looks like the pattern is that there's differences between the groups. You can see that the control group, about 22% had an event, only about 15% in the exercise group. And although we didn't analyze them separately, you can see from here that both the resistance exercise and the aerobic exercise group seem to have this lower rate of events um, um, at uh, long-term follow-up. So this is really the standard graph you would see in a chemotherapy trial or a radiation therapy or, or any biomedical intervention. And this is an eight-year follow-up on these patients. And what it suggests here is that the eight-year disease-free survival was 82.7% in the exercise groups uh, versus 75.6% for the group that did not exercise during their chemotherapy. So about a 7% absolute difference. Is that meaningful? Well, if this were a chemotherapy or a drug trial, this drug would be approved immediately for treatments in patients. Many of these chemotherapy trials are powered to find differences of 5% uh, in, in disease-free survival, and some of them even less than that. So when you look at 7%, exercise is as good a drug as any chemotherapy drug that might be approved in terms of linking it to disease-free survival. Now, this was a relatively small sample size, so it's not a reliable finding, but the suggestion is that certainly there's benefit. And the lower um, risk, you can see the what we call a hazard ratio, is about a 32% lower risk of having an event if you exercised while you're getting a chemotherapy. 32% lower risk of having an event eight years later. 
overall survival, which many uh, oncologists will say is even a more important outcome. Preventing the disease from occurring is important, but ultimately the question is how long do you live after these treatments? And again, you can see a, a strong pattern favoring the exercise groups. 91% overall survival in the groups that exercised while getting their chemotherapy, 82.7%. So about a 9% absolute difference and even a stronger, stronger hazard ratio. So a 40% lower risk of dying eight years later after treatments if you exercised while you were getting these chemotherapy treatments. I won't worry about this. It's a similar type of um, outcome, and same with here, all in the, the same direction. We can look at it by subgroups as well, and some interesting data uh, in terms of that. Again, very exploratory data, but uh, the data suggests that you get slightly stronger effects for patients who are overweight or obese while going through these treatments. So exercise might even be more beneficial if you're overweight or obese while going through these treatments. More beneficial if you have stage 2 or stage 3 disease. Uh, so these are the higher stages where there's a greater risk of recurrence. Uh, potentially more important if your ER, estrogen receptor status, is positive. And a couple other uh, very important findings as well. So how do we explain this finding? Is it really true and what would the potential explanations be? Well, as I mentioned, the patients who exercise while they're on chemotherapy actually completed more chemotherapy. That alone can be very important. It's well documented in the literature that um, the more of your treatments you complete, the lower the risk of the disease coming back. And so anything that improves treatment completion rates is very likely to improve these outcomes. But I think the, um, the more likely explanation is this second explanation, that physical activity or exercise might potentiate the effects of chemotherapy. So that means it might interact to make these treatments more effective. And exercise can influence things like drug distribution, pharmacodynamics, how these drugs are metabolized as well. And again, a bunch of potential explanations there that people are looking at now in terms of animal models, looking at the role of exercise while you're on chemotherapy and what sort of effects it, it, it might have. The other term we sometimes use is a chemosensitizer. So this is something that simply makes your chemotherapy more effective. And it's possible that exercise is like a chemosensitizer. If you exercise while getting these treatments, uh, the drugs work even better. So those are provocative data. We do need larger trials looking at exercise and breast cancer outcomes. But in the absence of some of these larger trials, uh, we can look at better designed cohort studies. And this is a study that we've launched a few years ago in Alberta called the Alberta Moving Beyond Breast Cancer Cohort Study. And the whole focus of this study is, again, trying to generate information about the role of physical activity and health-related fitness as it relates to uh, cancer, breast cancer survival. And so for this study, we're establishing this cohort. Um, and again, the focus is on exercise and fitness. And we're going to look at outcomes, uh, determinants of exercise, mechanisms of how it would work, moderators, and so on. Uh, but the primary focus is on the survival outcomes. So it's what we call a prospective cohort design. We recruit breast cancer patients as soon as they're diagnosed, within about 90 days of surgery. Uh, we're trying to recruit a sample of about 1,500 Alberta breast cancer patients with uh, stage one to stage 3C disease. We assess them as soon as we can after diagnosis. We're going to assess them again at one year and at three years, and then again at five years. And then we're going to follow them for these long-term outcomes to see what happens. So the real um, genius, if you will, of this cohort study is because it's designed to focus on health-related fitness and physical activity, we have all the gold standard measures of fitness in this cohort study. So we have comprehensive measures of physical activity as well as sedentary behavior. We have objective measures. So we use accelerometers at all these assessment time points so we can get objective measures of how much exercise these patients are doing. We do maximal strength testing as well as muscular endurance um, testing uh, and uh, flexibility and balance. And we do maximal cardiorespiratory testing as well. So VO2 max in all of these patients 
if they are <coughs> able and willing, and if uh, not, for those who aren't uh, doing as well, we do submaximal testing. We will have body composition data based on DEXA scans, so we can look at lean body mass, fat mass, as well as whether these patients are considered to be sarcopenic, and uh, lymphedema and other outcomes as well. So the whole idea then in this cohort study is, can we link things like mac maximal strength, aerobic fitness, objective physical activity to cancer recurrence and survival? And if we can, we can come up with more precise information about what types of exercise, what amounts of exercise. If you are stronger, does that mean you're going to live longer? If you're fitter, does that mean you're going to live longer? So all these questions that are related to kind of the exercise and fitness um, um, questions that patients have, we can hopefully answer with this cohort study. So we began the study in June 2012. We've already had uh, almost 500 patients volunteer for the study. Uh, so we're, accrual is moving along quite well. Still going to be a few more years. These are very long studies to do uh, and follow up on. Um, and we've already had uh, uh, over 200 patients with one year follow up as well. And there's um, different uh, reasons related to eligibility and, and so on. So another study we did uh, was in lymphoma patients. As I mentioned, a lot of the exercise research is focused on breast cancer patients. Prostate cancer patients has a fair bit. Um, but a lot of these other cancer patient groups are really understudied. And one of these groups is lymphoma patients. So this was a trial we did looking at uh, an aerobic exercise intervention compared to no exercise in patients who are diagnosed with lymphoma. And it was really the first study to focus on lymphoma patients and to compare how patients were responding, whether they were on chemotherapy or off chemotherapy. And we looked at all sorts of uh, quality of life endpoints, physical functioning, fitness, and so on. So these are the uh, findings related to aerobic fitness. Again, maximal VO2 testing. And overall, we had a very nice effect, a 20% improvement in aerobic fitness, which is quite a large improvement over a 12-week supervised exercise intervention. The other interesting thing you can see here is the magnitude of the benefit was the same whether they were on chemotherapy or off treatments. Both groups benefited to the same amount. How they got that benefit is slightly different. So once again, you can see for the group that's on chemotherapy, you're actually preventing some decline in aerobic fitness that happens while you're on chemotherapy uh, and then reversing that with gains. Where if you're not on treatments, um, the intervention just results in all gains compared to not doing uh, any exercise. You can look at quality of life data, and you can see these mirror uh, the fitness data quite closely. And what we're seeing from a number of these studies, including the HELP trial, is that these changes in objective fitness parameters, like muscular strength, uh, physical functioning, aerobic fitness, actually do drive improvements in quality of life. So the bigger fitness gains you get, the more you report that your quality of life's improved, and the more you have better symptom management. And these data suggest that here as well. So you can see if you're on chemotherapy, quality of life declines while you go through chemotherapy. But if you exercised while you're on chemotherapy, dramatic improvements in, in quality of life. So what about chemotherapy completion in this group? Now, here we just track the number of cycles that they had received. So there's some sort of minimum and some sort of maximum number of chemotherapy cycles that the oncologist would like to give, and we could compare those two groups. Not statistically significant, <clears throat> so not a reliable finding, but you can see the pattern of the findings, that the exercise group is actually completing slightly more chemotherapy cycles than the usual care group. So certainly evidence that it's not undermining their ability to complete these chemotherapy cycles, and possibly, combined with other studies, suggesting that it may actually be helping them complete um, more cycles. But the real interesting and, uh, and provocative finding for this study was we also tracked the response of these patients who were on chemotherapy, and it was only just a subset, 54 of these patients were on chemotherapy. We actually tracked their tumor response. So these patients have existing disease. They go through these chemotherapy um, treatments, can be four months, six months, and at the end of it, 
The oncologists do various scans, various um, assessments on the disease, and they make a judgment about whether or not the patient has stable disease, meaning it hasn't changed, it really hasn't gotten worse, but it hasn't gotten better. Uh, they have a partial response, which means the number of tumors or the size of tumors have shrunk, but there's still some there. Or they have a complete response, meaning there's no evidence of any disease after the treatments. Obviously, patients would like to have a complete response to their chemotherapy. And what these data suggest, not significant, fairly small numbers, but uh, suggestive of it, is a benefit to, this, uh, to exercise. So if you exercised while you're on chemotherapy, about 46% of those patients had a complete response to their chemotherapy. Only about 30% of patients on the usual care arm had a complete response to chemotherapy, suggesting once again that perhaps exercise is helping chemotherapy treat these tumors in lymphoma patients. So we had the same idea after the success of following up with our START trial. We thought, well, maybe we should follow up for the long-term outcomes uh, for this lymphoma trial as well. These patients were randomized (coughs) between 2005 and 2008, and we followed them up in the summer of 2013. And once again, we looked at outcomes such as recurrence, progression of the disease, and, and death. And we explored the primary outcome in this particular group, what's called progression-free survival, which includes various events related to whether the disease is getting worse, whether you've died from the disease, and so on. And we did um, uh, some sophisticated analysis on it and followed them up at about uh, 61 months, so about five years. We didn't find any difference overall if you look at the top in terms of the randomization. Part of the problem, though, that we, we point out is that In this trial, the usual care group got a crossover. So after the end of the the, um, three-month intervention, they actually got a supervised exercise program that was pretty good. So it kind of confounds this longer-term follow-up when you're um, following patients for longer-term outcomes because the study wasn't designed for that. But we did look at those patients who didn't do any supervised exercise versus those who did. So a number of the patients in the crossover group didn't bother showing up for the crossover, the supervised exercise, where a number of them did actually show up and say, yeah, I want to do the supervised exercise program now that the study is over. And when you combine them together, so those who did supervised exercise for 12 weeks or so versus those who did not, you do get a trend towards a very nice effect. So the five-year progression-free survival was 68.5% for the patients that did some sort of supervised exercise, whether that part of the intervention or the crossover, versus 59% if they did no supervised exercise. So almost a 10% absolute difference in progression-free survival rates five years later if you did some supervised exercise as part of this program. Hazard ratio of 0.70 means about a 30% lower risk of having a progression-free survival event five years down the road. So you can see very similar to our breast cancer data in terms of roughly the potential magnitude of benefit. Um, And just in terms of exercise, you can see here that the exercise group was still exercising more six months follow-up. So there are some benefits to these supervised exercise programs that uh, will keep patients exercising longer term. And when we compared the group that had the crossover versus no crossover, Those who showed up to do that crossover, that short-term exercise intervention, were still exercising much more six months later. So supervised exercise can be a very important component of long-term behavior change. So I'll move now to a a couple of ongoing uh, studies we have. And, And this one's called the Colon Health and Lifelong Exercise Change Trial. We call it the Challenge Trial. This is really the first study designed to look at these questions. These previous studies I I, um, discussed with you were not really designed to look at long-term outcomes. They were not really powered, meaning large enough sample sizes to look at uh, these types of outcomes, but this study is. And the focus is in on uh, colon cancer survivors, where there's very strong evidence that higher rates of exercise are linked with longer survival and uh, lower risk of recurrence. Excuse me. We plan on randomizing 962 participants uh, in this study. 
And uh, the nice thing about this study is it's a collaboration between Canada and Australia right from the get-go. So it's been great working with many Australian groups in, in collaborating on this very important study. This is the basic design of the study. We do put half the patients in an exercise program where we give them some supervised exercise, a lot of behavioral counseling that will hopefully help them exercise long term. The comparison group gets health education materials, which right now in Canada is the standard of care that we would give most patients, information about how much exercise they should do and, and so on, but they don't get this particular support program that we've developed. So the study's open in 20 centers in Canada, 26 centers in Australia. Um, <clears throat> these data have been updated now. We've randomized about 330 patients on the study. So the study's uh, moving along. It's going to be a few more years yet before we get all the patients we need uh, into this particular study. But we're seeing most patients doing well in the exercise intervention, adhering to the program, and many of them Im improving fitness over the course of the program as well. These are some participants uh, in Edmonton, Canada. Uh, this is from my Behavioral Medicine Fitness Center where we uh, run these trials. This is a description of some of the uh, patients who have participated in this study. Not critical and in, uh, important information right at this stage. Uh, and that's the long-term follow-up rates in terms of fitness testing. Just to say that, very good. So we have over 90% of patients showing up for their fitness testing, even three years um, later on. So we've got good adherence to the fitness testing protocol in this study as well. And uh, there's the actual adherence to the supervised exercise sessions and the um, support programs. And this is data based on 154 patients. So over 80% in the first six months are showing up and getting their behavioral support and supervised exercise. And even in the second six months, we're up around 70%. So again, doing quite well with the study. The last one I'll talk about here is just to um, sort of prime you to what I think is only the second study of an exercise intervention targeting uh, uh, progression-free survival or survival outcome in cancer patients. And this is being called the GAP-4 trial that's really being uh, run by Movember. Uh, many of you will know about Movember and fundraising for men's health related to prostate cancer, testicular cancer, mental health issues. And they are investing a lot of money in this study because they view it as a very important question for prostate cancer patients. Some ob observational data suggesting that uh, patients who exercise live longer, but this will be the first study really targeting um, survival as a primary endpoint to definitively answer the question, if you're a prostate cancer patient with advanced cancer and you start an exercise program, can you really improve your progression-free survival and your overall survival? Uh, once again, this is a, a trial with strong leadership from Australia, particularly Rob Newton at Edith Cowan University, who's uh, co-chair of the steering committee. So Australia is playing a leading role in this trial. It will be joined by many other countries around the world who will be participating. So really a multinational trial that will hopefully provide the definitive answer to this question for prostate cancer patients around the world. So they're still working on the protocol. It's in development. Uh, it looks like there's going to be a strong supervised exercise component in, in the study uh, for the first 6 to 12 months of the intervention. Uh, when you're trying to change disease outcomes, you really need to keep patients exercising for a long period of time. When you're focusing on fitness outcomes or quality of life, we can see improvements fairly quickly. In a matter of weeks and certainly in a matter of a couple months, we can see improvements in cardiovascular fitness, muscular strength, quality of life. But when you're trying to alter the course of a disease, uh, this is where the long-term exercise motivation and adherence becomes important because we don't think this is something that, that happens with short-term exercise adherence. Uh, the goal is about 1,000 patients here as well. So again, a very big trial. It'll take some time to accrue and run this trial, but answering a very important question. And I think the plan is to launch this trial uh, sometime in 2015. So summarizing across what we know about exercise, lifestyle, and survival, uh, I think there's lots of self-reported exercise data suggesting that it is associated with improved survival, particularly in breast and colon, but some studies in prostate cancer as well. We have what we call phase two data. These are these smaller randomized trials. 
I presented to you today from breast cancer and lymphoma patients, suggesting that a supervised exercise intervention may improve uh, disease-free survival, progression-free survival. A couple phase three trials. So the phase three trials are what we consider the large definitive trials. I mentioned the one uh, we have ongoing in uh, um, colon cancer as well as the one in prostate cancer. So these two trials really are designed to answer this question. There are a number of lifestyle trials going on as well. By lifestyle, I mean studies where they combine exercise and nutritional intervention to try and look at whether or not that can improve survival. And lastly, there's lots of interest in weight loss trials because of the data suggesting obesity and weight gain might be linked with higher rates of recurrence and shorter survival in breast cancer. People are discussing whether or not we should do weight loss trials in cancer patients to see, once again, whether or not you can improve survival from the disease. I'll end by acknowledging many colleagues, students, staff, and study participants who have contributed to this research and also the Canada Research Chair's program that supports my position at the University of Alberta. Thank you for your time. A terrific presentation and terrifically on time. <laughs> uh, the floor's open if anybody would like to ask a question while you've got one of the world experts in the room. And, and breast cancer uh, in relation to uh, exercise. Does this apply to other cancers as well? Um, we're not sure. And so what we see in the literature is each cancer is different. So it's the same reason why you get different chemotherapy drugs for different cancers, because it's not sort of a single mechanism that drives all these cancers. So given that, we're not sure um, what cancers exercise might be linked to. And it's very difficult to generalize across cancers to say, well, if it's good for prostate cancer, it'll be good for lung cancer or pancreatic cancer, because each of these cancers is quite different. Um, so in terms of things like quality of life and improvements in physical functioning, we probably can generalize across cancers, that you will get these types of benefits related to fitness, potentially symptom management, quality of life. But in terms of the disease aspects, recurrence and survival, uh, we're probably going to have to do these studies in each of these different cancer patient groups to see uh, whether or not exercise might be effective. But as a general principle, uh, controlled exercise is very beneficial. Yes, that's right. And that's probably been studied um, in quite a few cancer patient groups. So we do have studies in lymphoma patients, um, bladder cancer patients, kidney. So across a lot of these cancers, you're seeing more studies looking at quality of life and fitness. And as a general principle, you're seeing these benefits across the different patient groups. Um, in terms of the exercise uh, modality and uh, intensities, what are sort of some of the recommendations around those? Yeah, it, <clears throat> we don't have an optimal exercise prescription yet that we can give, but we, we see the general pattern of more being better in the sense that um, doing more exercise is, is usually more beneficial. There's some data to suggest that the higher intensity stuff is better, if possible for you, if you're fit enough and healthy enough to do that. Certainly, the recommendation is for combined strength and aerobic exercise. So ideally, if you can do some strength training along with your aerobic exercise. Uh, but the general recommendation is, is sort of to do as much as you're willing and able to do, including uh, something as simple as brisk walking. So if you're able to do brisk walking, there's lots of studies showing that that can be beneficial. <clears throat> if you're able to do more than that, and certainly if you're able to do some sort of weight training program, especially while you're going through these treatments, that can be very effective as well. Just hold on a sec while we get the microphone, sorry. Um, wouldn't you say that um, the age would be a big factor in that as far as um, getting uh, well and getting a lot better? Age? Well, um, just in the mortality rate itself, 
Like if you're looking at a younger person, you're looking at an older person, obviously the, the older person is not going to um, you know, benefit as much as a younger person would. Perhaps in, ter it, yeah, yeah. So Perhaps I'm, I'm, in terms of yeah. survival benefits, yes. depending on how long um, yes, um, the patient has to live and long-term survival. But in many of the other outcomes, some of the older patients and the more deconditioned patients benefit even more because they have a compromised physical reserve already mm -hmm. when they're diagnosed with cancer and they go through very difficult treatments and they don't have a lot of physical reserve to get through those treatments. So sometimes we see the older patients, the more frail patients benefiting even more from a modest program because it doesn't yeah. take a lot for them to benefit in terms of strength exercise and aerobic exercise. So we think the benefits are for all these patients, although the survival benefit, <clears throat> uh, as you say, might, might be a little uh, stronger for younger patients. Oh, hi. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. In terms of the prostate cancer investigation, I'm not sure whether I missed it, will there be an examination of the interconnection between physical health emotional health, and then on, of course, on the uh, treatment, etc., effectiveness of the treatment. Yes, absolutely. So in all these studies, e even the ones I presented that look at survival, we look at quality of life as a very important outcome, and that includes emotional aspects of quality of life, psychosocial issues, as well as the physical and functional issues. And you're right, we'd, we'll be able to look at the effects of exercise on both the physical and emotional health and how that might feed into long-term survival uh, of the disease. My, my question is, uh, with exercise programs, there's often a, a very poor compliance, and you see that with injured patients. If you ask them to show the exercise they're doing, they struggle. They obviously haven't done them for a while or do them incompletely. You mentioned supervision in your program, and you mentioned counsellors providing some support for continuity of the program. Have you looked at dealing with distant patients who, uh, and that's a problem here and in Canada where they're yeah. 300 kilometres from the centre or so on, have you looked at any way of monitoring the program with distant patients? We haven't looked at it personally, but there has been some research on that. <coughs> Compliance can be a challenge. Many of these trials, like ours, get very good adherence to them, but it is a bit more of a select group of patients that participate in these studies. Oftentimes, we recruit maybe 30 or 40 percent, so these are the more motivated, keen patients. We provide a ton of support during the supervised exercise and afterwards, and they get dramatic benefits from that intervention. Once you get to some of the distance-based stuff, you know, whether it's internet delivery, print materials, and so on, um, the evidence for benefit from those is much more modest. You don't seem to get the same level of benefit. So it is really a tricky balance. We want to get the programs out to those patients. Ideally, we'd like to get them these optimal programs, which uh, many of us believe does include a supervised exercise component with sort of behavioral counseling and follow-up. Um, some of these more distance-based ones, I think, are better than nothing at all, if that's what the choice is. Uh, but probably not as beneficial as some of these supervised programs where patients get a lot of hands-on information, they learn about exercise, how to progress the prescription, and, and so on. Um, <coughs> I'd like to just uh, request, uh, is there anything to do with the blood uh, carrying on? Because uh, when they had the barley um, up there, that uh, bombing was about 11 years ago, I uh, went to donate blood at the Red Cross. They uh, took a check, and uh, of course I had just completed 12 months before a chest cancer thing uh, from the doctor, just a small one. Uh, they didn't want my blood. So it was a John West reject that they said. So <laughs> um, it comes back to the fact that I've just completed in uh, March, uh, February, March, 35 days of going over to Sir Charles Gardner. And you've got uh, four machines doing 40 people a day going through that uh, institution there and they're uh, doing an amazing job. I just wonder, does it, do your blood has a, a carryover effect or anything like that? Um, i just been treated, uh, done a, last Monday, the doctor, ga uh, Spry, gave me a clearance from uh, this prostrate. Thank you. I'm sorry I didn't catch the...
question there. Could you? Does the blood carry through? Oh, oh, does one cancer increase the risk of another cancer? Um, yeah, uh, there, there can be. In fact, one of the fastest growing issues within the cancer survivorship area is people being diagnosed with a second cancer. So it is becoming a common occurrence, and people have discussed it in terms of things related to common genetics or common lifestyle issues that might feed into these types of cancers. There is also the possibility that the treatment of one cancer can then potentially uh, cause another cancer to occur. So it's complicated, but there are links among the different cancers. I'm just going to take one more. Uh, hello. Oh, um, hi. There's two parts to this question. Um, the first one is, did you, what, what's your view on cortisol? You know when you do sport, cortisol levels go up. And, so, and is there a... Um, a correlation between that's supposed to be not good for certain cancers can you talk about that i'm sorry i'm not do familiar you, with the link of cortisol to cancer no. not, well okay um okay no. not that question then um uh, can you uh, what well, discuss about uh tamoxifen and anti-estrogen tablets i was uh, very very fit um before suddenly finding out I had breast cancer, and now I'm on five years of tamoxifen, and I feel like life, you, the, my uh, life force is just sucked out of me from taking tamoxifen. You're, you talk about, uh, you know, doing exercise, and I was so sporty, and now, d just to get up and actually walk, I have to wait a couple of minutes for my something about your whole body, your joints and everything, it's not lubricated. And then after two or three minutes, it starts to activate again. Those anti-estrogen drugs are, I mean, they need, I don't know, the side effects from them are, ph are phenomenal. And they and it increase in your weight gain and lip, you are, there's so many side effects and all the bad ones. Yeah. So if you could discuss that. Yeah, oh. you raise one of the, the paradoxes we see in this field is that many of the things that exercise can help with, like fatigue, joint pain, some of these side effects are obviously determinants of exercise. So these are barriers that make it difficult for patients to exercise, and that's a real struggle. The side effects you talk about are quite common, and we know a large percentage of women stop taking these drugs because the side effects are so bad and that can be a real problem as well. There's one trial that's been done now looking at um, um, breast cancer patients on aerobitase inhibitors, and it did look at a year-long exercise intervention uh, in these breast cancer patients who reported some musculoskeletal pain, knee joint pain, and, and so on, and did show some benefits that these patients um, reported less pain from doing the exercise over the course of the year uh, compared to not doing the exercise but it didn't uh, change adherence to the medication or the long-term outcomes. So uh, I, I understand what you're saying. These things can be real barriers to starting the exercise, but if you can do it and start very low and progress it very slowly over time, you may see some benefits with some of these side effects uh, from these anti-estrogen drugs. Uh, can, can one... One's metabolism be increased because it, the anti-estrogen drugs seem to have, have. You end up with a whole load of fat on your thighs and bottom, but, you, but were never there before yeah. overnight, and it just you cannot shift it. And it, it's even if you you're, you go, you, uh, it's just what does one do? Yeah. And it is the tablets because it was not there before. Oh, yeah. Those are well-documented side effects of those anti-estrogen treatments. I mean, one thing to potentially consider is some strength exercise if, if the body composition changes are really a key issue. We know uh, in prostate cancer patients that are losing lean body mass, gaining fat, that a weight training intervention can really reverse those types of outcomes. Nobody that I know of has looked at it in breast cancer patients on these anti-estrogen therapies, but it makes sense that potentially trying more of a weight training program than, say, an aerobic exercise program might help you deal with some of those side effects. 
Uh, just to clarify, the study that's being conducted next year at Edith Cowan University, um, will you be including a range of cancers, particularly blood cancers, in the study to see the effects of longevity from exercise? That study will only be prostate cancer patients. Okay. So again, this is because each of these cancers is different and unique. We typically, just like a drug trial, will focus on a specific cancer patient group and see whether or not exercise can help uh, with that group. All right, we're just about to wrap up, but I'm going to use my prerogative to ask one last question. Uh, any downsides, any negatives to exercising during treatment? Any cautions, precautions? Um. <clears throat> There, there are precautions, and we still haven't um, really documented all the potential side effects or downside. I think certainly overall the benefits outweigh the risks. But we do see in some patients if they're struggling and having difficult side effects that it may be important to stop the exercise while you're having these very difficult side effects. And exercising during treatment is good if you are able to do it. And if you're able to do it, there are these benefits. If you're not, in other words, your side effects are very severe, you're not feeling well going through these treatments, the next best thing is to start as soon as you can after treatments, after you've recovered from some of these side effects. So at some point, you want to restart an exercise program, even if you're not able to do it during. In terms of um, side effect, you know, we used to think it possibly caused lymphedema. There's no evidence of that anymore. Other um, side effects don't seem to be very severe, other than the standard risks you might have someone who's exercising who might have some stiffness or soreness from the uh, exercise. Terrific. Thank you. And we'll thank Professor Corneo again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stand up and listen to the...